Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. This is September 11, 2000. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Lucian Thalheimer. Lou, how are you this morning? A little warm and wet, but otherwise very well. <laughs> Thank warm you. and wet. Lou, can we begin by my asking you how old you are? 72. 72, and your current address? In Natick. Current marital status? Married. And you have children? Two, a boy and a girl. And grandchildren? Two, a boy and a girl. Gee, should we <laughs> keep going on this winning streak? There must be something in the genes or something. <laughs> Great grandchildren? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Where were you born, Lou? Albany, New York. Albany, and raised there? Yes. Uh, till you were how old? 21, 22. And did, where, where did you go to from there? Uh, well, I had finished college. I came over to Boston to begin a professional career. Uh, were you living in the city itself? Yes, Boston? right in the Back Bay area. And what was this professional career? Well, I just started in the Filene's Merchandise Training Program. Mm -hmm. And how did you eventually wind up in Natick? Oh, uh, eventually. Uh, well, first I immediately left Boston, went in the Army for a couple of years, returned to Boston. Eventually, after two or three years, met my future wife. We lived in Boston proper for about six months and then moved to Brookline. And after Brookline, for about six years, we moved to Natick. That was 19, 1963. 63, so you'll, you've got 600 years before you'll be a townie. <laughs> Looking forward to it someday. All right, so that you entered the military from the city of Boston, let's pursue that. What was Boston like? And um, at the time you w were going into the military, what was the year? That was 1950. 1950. And you were how old then? 22. 22 years old. And you, um, let's see, had the Korean War broken out in 1950? That's started, I think, in June of that year. I may be mistaken, but I think it was June. And, and what, what impelled you into the military? The draft. All right, you were drafted. You were in this training program? In Filene's at that okay, point. Okay, so But that you only lasted for about one month before I was summoned to a pre-induction physical back in Albany where I was registered with the draft. Okay, tell us about that, what the process was in 1950. You had been registered for the draft mm -hmm. and you were uh, out of school. Working. I had just, just graduated that June, yes. Okay. Where were you on the day the North Koreans overran the, uh, the uh, 17th parallel? You heard about this. Probably in Boston. Yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon. I was probably still in Albany. I worked that summer yeah. from, oh, early June until Labor Day. And early in September is when I came to Boston, but by that time the Korean War had started. And you picked up a paper one evening and realized this might affect you? I really didn't think it would, didn't, uh, I was not aware that it would affect me. I this knew it was going on. This is a long way on, off, yeah. But it was so remote and distant at that point, I had no conception that I would be involved. And what was your first inkling? Did you hear from the government? Yeah, the local board in Albany, Selective Service Board, notified me that I would be called for a pre-induction physical exam probably, oh, early October, which is when I returned to Albany and went through my induction processing. At Albany, New York. Yeah, and then early in November, I was actively induced. <laughs> induced. Can you tell us about that being in Albany with a bunch of other guys who were called together with you? What was the feeling in that group? Anticipation, some fear, mostly jocularity, I guess you'd call it. We were all pretty uh, unimpressed with the whole situation because I think it was still so remote. 
uh, so distant that I don't think we really perceived ourselves as part of all of this. It was an interruption in our own private lives, and that's the anticipation. That Did you think that you might just uh, be called to active duty or inactive duty? What was uh, the anticipation? Oh, we expected to be called to active duty. Uh, I can't say that we expected immediately to be sent to war, of course, but we knew there'd be a certain amount of basic training, and after that we had no conception, no idea what would happen. So this is now, we're getting into the late fall of 1950, yep. is that correct? Yep. And tell us about being literally called up and wh where, where did you go? Well, we were examined and uh, sworn in, so to speak, in Albany and then immediately shipped over to Ayer, Massachusetts to Fort Devens. We had about five or six days of processing there, inoculations and uh, picking up uniforms and beginning to learn a little of the Army way of life. And from Fort Devens, I was shipped with the rest of the inductees from the Albany area, the group I was with, to, well, Alabama. Uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the camp. Block. I can't remember the name of the Oh, I was going to write down Block. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it'll come to me sooner or later, okay. but right at the moment I don't remember the it's name. It's not that important. I'd like to know about that five days of processing. That kind of determined where you would go. There were tests that were given yeah. at that point. Uh, presumably they were scrutinized and examined as to where our assignments would be. Is this what directly sent you to Alabama? I think so because I was immediately assigned when we got there along with a group from my own area to this 175th Military Police Battalion which was a National Guard organization that had been mobilized. Well. Were other fellows that you knew with you at this well, time? Quite a few, yeah. Uh, where did you know them from? High school, some from grammar school. Uh, simply from living around Albany, some of the guys I had played football against in high school or baseball. Uh, there must have been at least a dozen that I knew intimately from high school. From Devons to Alabama, this, the group was together. Mm, quite, a, quite a few of us. Uh, did you th use the term military police? Yes. Okay. How is it that you all stuck together in that uh, category? I have no were idea. Were they all big guys like you? Uh, most of them were reasonably good size, but not all of them. There were a few who were rather frail and, and small. How about the uh, athletic background? Was that a common denominator? I can't think that it was. No, there were quite a few who were never participants in, in athletics. It just seemed to me to be a random group of bodies that were physically fit. So bulk had nothing to do with it? Not that I was aware of. I'm always, when I think of an MP or an SP as somebody carrying a stick and able mm -hmm. to use it. Uh, I would say in the, the so-called line companies, they had a tendency to be fairly good size. Uh, the fellows who were out on active patrol ran to pretty, pretty formidable people most of the time. Um, there was another, there were four companies in the battalion and some of us were assigned to the headquarters company, which is where I wound up. For what reason, I have no idea. Okay, tell us about uh, being in Alabama, assigned to the headquarters battalion. What did they expect you? Well, initially, we were go undergoing basic training. There was nothing particularly uh, peculiar about the training among the group, as far as I can recall. There were some, uh, what do you call them, military uh, military specialists designations and for whatever reason I was assigned to this headquarters company along with the, at least one other fellow that I knew. 
Most of the people who were in the group that I was drafted with wound up in the uh, active MP uh, companies of the battalion. They eventually were the ones who were out on patrol and performing certain duties that the headquarters company personnel were not. Okay, was there a, an interim processing um, testing area where you were deselected, as it were, that you were not part of the group that went out on the streets? How did you, how did you get separated out? To be honest, I don't recall. I believe that I became friendly with a sergeant just by virtue of our being among this group who was the operations NCO, the, ch the chief military, what would you call him, the head NCO within the headquarters company. And I believe it was he who in, uh, invited me, so to speak, to apply to the company commander and, and the officer in charge mm -hmm. of the operations company, uh, headquarters company. And I talked with him and eventually was accepted into that group for what reason, I don't know. That's good. Sometimes that's the way those things worked out. Uh, was what you're learning now and what you were trained to do at that point, is that what you can continue to do during the rest of your military career? Yeah, by and large. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would you rather have done something else if you had your druthers? No, I was quite pleased to be in the headquarters company because we did a good deal of planning and uh, detail work on mapping out what the battalion's strategic assignment turned out to be. But in the meantime, you got all that close order drill stuff and oh, yeah. basic how training. to fire rifles and things Basic like that. training was more or less uniform for everybody in the battalion. How much infantry training did you get? Not very much. Uh, there was a certain amount of firing line and uh, orientation with various types of weapons, but I think, as I recall, it was minimal. <clears throat> had to qualify with a rifle, and that was about the only thing we really had to be semi-proficient with. Were you using uh, Garands at this time? We had carbines. You were using the carbine? Okay. Did the military, the, that is to say the U.S. Army, prepare you for cultural differences that you might encounter if you were sent to other countries? Did they sit down and talk with you about uh, Europe or Asia? No, not that I recall. About the only thing I can recall is that we were told to behave ourselves and not create any international incidents. Don't start another war. <laughs> We've got enough trouble. Yeah. yeah. And how long did you stay in Alabama, Lou? My best recollection is about, oh, three months. This should bring us up to uh, February of 51? Just about then, yeah. yeah, February or March. Did they let you get home at any time here? We had a short uh, furlough over the Christmas holiday season, yeah. And then in February of 51, uh, did you leave Alabama? Moved to Camp Atterbury in Indiana. And we remained there oh, till, uh, I can't remember the exact time, but roughly August. August of 51. Yep. I when think. you were sent out to Indiana, did you go as an individual or a unit? As a unit. And how many of your friends from Albany were part of this group? Virtually all of them. All of them. You're still a collective unit. More or less. But integrated into this uh, mobilized National Guard outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, because the National Guard outfit had been in uh, existence for a long while. They had most of the uh, higher echelon positions. They had sergeants, corporals, <coughs> PFCs, etc. Was this a Southern National Guard unit? Uh, somewhat Southern, yeah, from Missouri. And it encompassed, oh, anybody from 
whatever part of the state wished to join this particular National Guard organization. Some of them were from the major cities and the university city, I think Columbus is where the University of Missouri was. Many of them were from, oh, I'd call it the, the Ozark Mountains area, and were backwoodsmen. So it, it, it was quite a, a <coughs> polyglot group, but they were the ones who had the, initially, all of the... Uh, they had all the stripes. They had all the stripes yeah. and all the good positions. Yeah. How did you feel about that? Didn't like it, certainly didn't like taking orders from a bunch of guys that we did not respect in terms of intellect. Uh, we didn't think that their military backgrounds were such that they should have held positions of responsibility and authority. Quite a few of the people that I was drafted with were freshly out of college probably had an elevated opinion of ourselves, but we also felt that we, in many respects, were intellectually superior to the ones we had been commingled with. By and large, I would say, ultimately, many of the people I was drafted with worked their way up through the ranks and did assume more responsibility. Some of them quite, quite high, as a matter of fact. Something I neglected to ask you at the very uh, beginning. When you went into the Army, did you have a specific period of time to serve? Uh, two years, four years, to the duration? What? At that point in time, my recollection was we were bound for a two-year active duty term. I believe it was when we got out of that two-year period, we could either take, uh, I think it was an additional three years of active reserve participation or five years of inactive reserve. And I think, depending upon your choice at that point, it was either a five-year or seven-year term, at which point you were eligible for discharge. I'm not quite sure if that lets you know that uh, someday you were going to get out of this thing or you just felt that you were in the, until uh, the Army decided they could let you go. No, as a matter of fact, it was pretty firm that two years was about all of the active duty we would be responsible for. Thereafter, we had the option, as I say, either active or inactive reserve. Okay. Uh, we've got you in Indiana now, mm -hmm. and this is August of 51. Am I following you there? I'm trying to reconstruct, and I hadn't thought much about it. It was approximately nine months after being drafted, which was the beginning of November, so that would put it roughly the end of July or early August. Okay. And what did you do in Indiana? Training for uh, what I gather was the assignment of that military police battalion. They had a specific responsibility that they were gearing up for. And we did not know this. We weren't aware of this at the time. But we were continuing with a certain amount of basic training, uh, marches and infiltration courses and firing ranges, that sort of thing. And at the same time, we were also doing some uh, road, mart uh, what would you call them, convoy duty. One of the things that I particularly was responsible for, along with another fellow, also from Albany, who was in this particular company, the headquarters company, we did a great deal of mapping work, going out on a tour by ourselves, the two of us, and establishing uh, routes for convoy journeys, uh, during which the entire battalion would get out on the road follow the courses we had laid out, which were to conform with time elements, distances, different kinds of roads, different kinds of uh, regions, such as totally rural, which was easy to do in Indiana, small towns and large towns. And obviously, 
develop a certain amount of uh, familiarity, competence, maybe expertise in traveling as a unit mobilized through whatever terrain we had laid out in our plans. Where did you get the competence to do a thing like that? Made it up as we went along. We knew what well, we were I, supposed I think that, to do. Doesn't that call for, for some kind of specialized training? Not particularly. Uh, my military uh, specialty, MOS, was light truck driver. So I drove a Jeep. He, this other fellow, and I would be assigned to determine in a given locale within the state, general region, a route that would be uh, comfortable, possible, to conform with the requirements for time and distance and uh, type of terrain that we were supposed to encounter. And he and I would simply go out, measure distance on our, in our Jeep and clock the time and make notations as to what kinds of terrain we were in, what kinds of population areas we uh, encountered, and turn these into the captain to, and lieutenant to whom we reported in this uh, headquarters company. In essence, we were the planning unit for the battalion. To what end, Lou? Why were you doing this? Ultimately, when we were transferred, as we were, to Germany, the battalion was assigned a responsibility for determining strategic retreat routes, primarily for civilian population, in the given possibility that the Russians were going to come west. There was a great deal of concern at that point in time, or preparation, lest we encounter an invasion from the Russians who were well, in East Germany and the various Eastern Bloc countries at that point in time. The Army, in its infinite wisdom, decided they'd better be ready to move population out of there in case the Russians decided they wanted to get the rest of the country. So ultimately, our responsibilities in Germany conformed quite uh, similar, similarly to what we had been doing in Indiana. Mapping routes, determining positions for the location of supplies, radio communications, uh, avenues of, of escape for the civilian population in case we needed it in an emergency. In, in the grander strategic view, um, I think you, what you're saying is that the Korean War would trigger a response from the Russians to move east into Central Europe? Possibly. That's, that's a possibility? I do not know that there was a direct correlation between the Korean War and what we were doing in Europe. We were part of NATO. We reported to our commanders, reported to NATO as the supreme authority for military preparedness and defense in Europe. And whether there was any connection between the act of war and what we were preparing to encounter in Europe, I, I just don't know. At this point in time, did your group, uh, and you and the men you were working with, uh, did you have any idea that you were going to go to Korea? No. No. no we your were training was dedicated towards something in Europe? That's correct. And were you told specifically that you were going to go to Europe? Only when we got ready to get on a ship mm -hmm. going out of New York, we were told where we were going. At until we actually left the country or boarded the ship, I don't think any of us knew, at least none of uh, the people I was familiar with. What you're telling uh, me today uh, is something that I don't believe I've read about before. Um, have you found subsequent to this over the last 50 years or so any history of what you and your uh, organization did? No, not particularly. 
Now, it may well have been just a, uh, a whim, or it may well have been a well thought out uh, sense of preparation. We'd better be prepared just mm -hmm. in case. Somebody's got to do this if we ever get stuck with a wave of invasion coming from Eastern Europe, we'd better be ready to get the people out of there. Uh, a lot of the military people had dependents there. They were ensconced in, uh, in Western Europe and in Western Germany in particular. It had only been, what, about four or five years since the end of World War II, but our presence in Europe was considerable. And many of the personnel who were assigned had their dependents with them. Are you being more specific here then when you talk about uh, civilian personnel? Is this strictly American? No, they would certainly be our primary concern, but certainly not exclusive. I think it was designed to get any uh, self-propelled population out of the way, out of harm's way. Did you have target areas that you were responsible for? Uh, in general, yes. Uh, central Germany from the, 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 the West German border, bordering East Germany, uh, through to uh, whatever countries lay to the west of that, France, Belgium, Holland, Switzerland, certainly nothing specific, but with a definite idea that we would be responsible for constructing and maintaining plans to transport anybody who could transport themselves through, through the country from east to west in case there was an invasion. I'm not quite sure what sequence to ask you these questions in. Let's get you overseas. Uh, where are you going to do this? Uh, when did you go overseas? I believe it was August of 1951. That's, did you go straight from Indiana? Yeah, we went from Indiana to a, an embarkation point in New York, from there to Bremerhaven, Germany. Mm -hmm. You sailed over and... Um, Troop ship. Yeah, what was that like? Not terribly bad. It We've was, had guys in this room that sailed over on the Queen Mary. So <laughs> now this was this was a uh, my recollection was a converted, uh, what did they call them in World War II? V V ships or victory ships? They were transports, uh, which had been these Henry Kaiser ships, that sort of yeah. thing, which had been converted two troop ships. And we had responsibilities aboard the ship sometimes for KP work or uh, cleaning details and that sort of thing. But by and large, it was not a bad trip. Few people got sick. Uh, it was not a terribly rough <coughs> voyage, as I recall. Lasted, I think, about eight days. Had you ever been to sea before? No. So you lucked out then? Very much so. About the only unlucky aspect was that at one point, oh, about halfway across the Atlantic, some body or some people decided they would scrounge through the sleeping compartments, the, uh, oh, well, the, the, the sleeping areas where we were and take all the wallets they could find. I was one of the ones who was lucky enough to lose my wallet, wound up with whatever change, loose change I had in my pocket, and that's the way I entered Germany, borrowing. Dead broke. Yeah. Borrowing a few bucks here and there till the end of the month when we got paid again. Tell us about landing in Germany. You went to Bremerhaven? Yeah, Bremerhaven, and then boarded trains that would go south, uh, down through the center of the the heart, the, the center of the heartland of Germany to just about the central, maybe southern, little southern part of Germany around Stuttgart. 
This is 51. Uh, surely you saw a lot of uh, damage from the war. Oh, yes. Uh, can you tell us about what Germany looked like in 51? The little towns, by and large, didn't seem to be terribly affected, although I'm sure they were. We didn't have the chance to see too much of that. But the larger towns, like Stuttgart, were really just shells of what they had been. Uh, my recollection is that the main intersecting streets of Stuttgart were nothing but one floor of, uh, open, uh, available for occupancy, and whatever stood above them was just hollow walls. Uh, that particular city had taken a horrible pounding, we were told, partly by our own Air Force, but to a large extent by the French invasion army during the invasion of Germany. Uh, Stuttgart sits in a bowl with hills and small mountains all around it. And apparently the French just sat up on these mountains and shelled the city and just kept shelling it. And as a consequence, all we saw were ground floor occupancy. Anything above that had been either pulled down or left, if it was safe enough to leave, as something to be taken care of later. It was pretty, pretty badly gutted. What was your reception by the uh, population there? I would say it was cool, but not hostile. Uh, for the most part, the German civilians would uh, accept us. I think that's the best word. Is it fair to say that they were uh, looking at you as Americans, but in preference to your being Russians? Oh, yes. Yeah. Is there think, any anticipation on their part of uh, the Russians arriving in town? Not that I was aware of, no. Uh, the country was still rel relatively new to the division, and I think that was all that was on their minds as ter in terms of international uh, relations. They were far enough away from the east-west line of demarcation so that I don't think they were directly affected. Some of them obviously had families that were, they had been separated from, but for the most part I don't remember anything uh, in terms of fear, con even concern about mm -hmm. the Russians. What was your rank at this time, Lou? I think I was a corporal by then. Corporal, you seem to have uh, considerable responsibilities. Well, to a degree, yes. Uh, yeah, we were spending an, a, a still a great deal of our time developing uh, convoy routes and communications areas. Uh, it was a hilly part of the country, some low mountains, and it was not always possible to communicate by radio from one locale to another. So we had to run with radio trucks along with our mapping operations and make sure we could communicate from one uh, stopping point, one uh, bivouac area to another. Were you stationed in Stuttgart? Just outside of Stuttgart. Okay. It was what I believe was a former German Air Force base. And you're still with a lot of the guys that you knew from Albany, New York? Quite a few, yeah. I'm, I'm interested again in the atmosphere at the time and the, the terrain and a, a kind of desolated Germany. Um, and your job, as if I, if I understand it correctly, was to clear the path in case of an invasion from the east, from the Russians. Mm -hmm. Specifically then, what did you set out doing? The same thing as before, mapping in this? Relatively, yes. We would be out on either overnight convoy uh, operations or occasionally long-term uh, bivouac plans, uh, one in particular in uh, 
involved, as far as I know, not only our battalion, but many of the strategic forces that were located in Germany. And it lasted, as I remember it, for it was war games, pure and simple. Uh, lasted for about two weeks. And our particular headquarters companies established a command post, if you will, near Darmstadt, Germany. And we had patrols out running traffic and communications operations all around the central part of Germany. There were so-called aggressor forces that we had to be prepared for. I can remember being out on guard duty several nights. Uh, It was, it was like uh, any other war games, I'm sure, but it, it struck us as being somewhat serious and somewhat infantile. A, a good mixture of Army life. That's normal Army life, <clears throat> that's about right. How about the quality of the, the officers who led you? Are these the uh, same Missouri bunch? They are. Yeah, and, ha uh, and how well did they... Uh, but let me explain. There was a yeah. turnover at the command level for the battalion. The original commander who had been with the group back in Missouri was relieved. He retired, I believe, and a new commander was brought in. I think there was also a new operations officer, a major, who was brought in. Some of the officers who had been with the battalion back in Missouri were reassigned. Most all of these officers, if they weren't regular army, had to stay on with the National Guard. And some of them were fit for their particular responsibilities. Others were somewhat out of uh, their element. The two officers in charge of our particular uh, company had both been Air Force officers, pilots, one of them. Uh, their military training had virtually been exclusively pulled together during the National Guard operations, and they might not have been the best qualified for their posts. The company commander of the headquarters company was relieved of his drafted from New York City at about the same time that I was drafted from home. Supply NCO was another draftee. There were all sorts of uh, elevations to various responsible positions at this point in time. But anyhow, uh, I'm sorry, you, you asked a question which I think I've lost. No, you have answered it. I asked about the quality of your leadership at this particular yeah, some time. Some were fine. Some were very good. I had a great deal of respect for the two officers, the captain and the lieutenant, who were directly responsible for the headquarters company. I respected them considerably. Even though they had both been Air Force officers, I think they adapted well. They had been uh, oriented quite comfortably and thoroughly towards their responsibilities. Uh, some of the other company commanders were excellent, although I didn't have that much to do directly with them. I did have a very close friend from home who wound up in what was known as B Company. They were just regular patrol MPs, but he always How about food? Did they feed you well? And I would say reasonably yeah. well. I, you know, it was army food, it was institutional cooking, and you can't, can't claim it was like home, but it was, it was all right. Okay, back to work. Um, did you have target populations that you knew you were going to have to have part of your clearance process? Did you tell them you were there for this reason? Not that I'm 
aware. No. Now, there may have been divisions civilian population. Well, were you now still setting up uh, maps and... Uh, yeah. I was in Germany. But... When we were in Germany, I think we had not encountered one another until that point. And he was originally assigned to one of the line companies, A or B company, I don't remember, remember which. And when an opening became available uh, in the headquarters company, I guess I kind of arranged that he could apply for that, and he was ultimately transferred to travel to other countries. Uh, this fellow from Melrose and I went on about three. Spain or Portugal, which we wanted to do, but we just plain ran out of furlough time. <laughs> we used every minute we had. But I was about to say, they, they were very generous with you. What about the rest of Germany? The same impression of a pretty flattened place? Insofar as we were able to determine, yes, it had been pretty badly bombed, shelled. Uh, Never did get to Berlin because that was in the eastern part of the country. Uh, my recollection was Frankfurt seemed to be about the same way. Certainly Munich, which we saw, was in the same virtual condition that Stuttgart was in. The rebuilding process had begun, but it was certainly a long way from being even thoroughly uh, pursued at that point. The war was um, over only five years, I think you said a moment About ago. About that. I think it was what? 19... Uh, they got back into, re into production fairly, fairly soon, as far as I am aware, but they were certainly putting out cars then. And I assume, but can't really tell you for sure, that other industry was back in, in business. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have an opportunity to sit down with uh, German civilians over um, dinner, perhaps, or in a beer hall and talk about what had happened? We had the opportunity, but I don't recall that I ever did. No. Was there any uh, restriction on your dealing uh, on a social level with the Germans? None that I ever heard of, no. A lot of the guys became very friendly with German women. Um, we had at least conversation with some of the German men because they were hired to work around the camp where we were stationed. Uh, they had rather menial jobs such as cleaning and working on in the kitchens and things of that sort, but uh, my recollection is that they were perfectly satisfied. Maybe satisfied isn't the right word. Uh, they were willing to take on these menial jobs because there were relatively few opportunities elsewhere. However, such things as having our particular barracks cleaned once a week in preparation for Saturday inspections. We'd have a particular German man come in and for a carton of cigarettes, he would take care of cleaning up the floors and dusting and doing whatever needed to be done to get the place ready for inspection. Uh, there were a lot of people who were still working on farms in our area. It was primarily a, an agricultural area around Stuttgart. And a lot of them were working in restaurants. There were a lot of restaurants around in Stuttgart and elsewhere. And that was perhaps one of the major industries because they were feeding American soldiers. Whenever we could get a pass, we'd get into Stuttgart, eat, take in whatever uh, entertainment was available. I recall a couple of sessions at the Stuttgart Opera Company 
and which was just really beginning to get back into swing. And you'd sit in the opera hall, and as you asked earlier about the conditions, you could look up and see clear sky above you. You could see holes in the walls. From the outside of the building, you could see the shell of the upper walls that were still in place. Not intact, but in place. Uh, there were various other cultural and recreational opportunities around the area, but they were fairly limited. But my personal activities didn't take me very much into contact with any of the civilians. Mm -hmm. if, if I'm following the timeline correctly, the, the war in Korea is still going on? Very much so, yeah. Uh, what did you hear? Did you hear about it, or did you follow that? We'd mostly hear about it on the radio and newscasts. Uh, the American, uh, oh, what is it, the Armed Forces Radio? Yes. And Stars and Stripes, we'd read about it. But it really was a long way off and didn't... I'd, I'd say the Korean War didn't affect me personally until after I got out of the Army and began to make some reacquaintance with people I had known who were actually in Korea. People who I'd graduated from college with who had had direct uh, combat experience. Did you feel where you were that you were in a, how can I phrase this, that you were in a backwater part of the Army operations or that you were really on the leading edge of some potential disaster? I would say neither of those. I think we would say we considered ourselves just god-awful lucky to be where we were. That we were doing our so-called duty, partly because we couldn't escape it, but we were serving our military obligations in the least hazardous way that we could think of. And we were doing something that could possibly be extremely important, but probably wouldn't. And we played the game, in a sense. Uh, we knew we were going to get out when, when we were due to get out. Can't say that we were graceful in our service to the country at that point. But we did what we were supposed to do. I think we did it reasonably well. We thought it had potential significance and then discounted that significance because we didn't expect the Russians would come west. But they could have. Absolutely. Yeah. They were very strong militarily in Eastern Europe and East Germany. And we all knew what they had done when they finally broke out of their own country. Uh, had repelled the German invasion and began to muster their own forces and what they did and how they seemed to feel toward the end of 1944 and into 45. They had suffered terribly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And well, I think we recognized that they had a well-grounded hostility toward the Germans. I think we all recognized there was a possibility, even though I think we discounted it. We sublimated the whole concept of fighting and further war in Europe at that point. Did you run into uh, troops from any other nation or, or any military organizations, French, British, Russian, uh, in, where you were? No. That's no. strictly an American operation. That was, yes. Yeah. I think. There were sectors of Europe, as you probably recall, that were divided up among the nationalities responsible. Uh, but we didn't encounter any that I recall other than Americans. <clears throat> okay, you are in Germany and you are doing your thing, but the clock is running, fortunately for you. Mm -hmm. um, are you getting down toward where you're going to go home? Oh yeah. Be discharged. Yeah, we were. I was personally in Germany for about 15 months, and the rotation 
of the group I was familiar with and most of the military police battalion began uh, roughly around the middle part of September, I beg your pardon, of October of 1952. And my best recollection is we were brought home in about three waves, <clears throat> middle of October till roughly the beginning of November. So you weren't on any kind of a point system. You would just knew that you were going to get out two years after. Just a question uh, of being serving called to active a certain service. amount of time. Yeah, what wave were you in, Lou? I came back in the last group. Uh, got back to the United States in, I believe it was around November 7th of 52, and then went down to. Uh, Oh, big discharge center in New Jersey. Fort Dix? Or Fort Dix, thank yeah. you. Uh, How'd you get home? Sailed home again? Came back on a troop ship. Hung onto your wallet this time? Hung onto my wallet and hung onto my meals. We ran into a tail end of a hurricane. November is not a good time to cross the Atlantic. There were days when we logged no distance at all, just held our own. And it was about a 10 day or 12-day trip, but fortunately most of us fared well enough, went through the mustering out process at Fort Dix. Did you come into New York? Yes. That's, uh, th how did you feel sailing into New York Harbor? Anticipatory. <laughs> I was <laughs> dying to get out of the service. Had you... Um, had you met your wife prior to going overseas? No. So that great and wonderful event happened after you got home? Two or three years, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Were you just discharged out of New Jersey? Yes, discharged yeah. uh, qualitatively. We still had that reserve time to contend, contend with. We had to opt for active or inactive reserve before we left Fort Dix, as I recall. What was your decision? Oh, I wanted the inactive, took my chances, I guess, but I wanted the, the least to do with the military that I could arrange. Then what? You went on to school? Uh, no, I went back, I, I came back to Boston and yeah. went back to work in Filene's January of 1953. Home again. Was there a most memorable experience in your career that, that two years that when you think about your Army life, th something stands out above everything else? Uh, two things. One was that uh, war games experience up near Darmstadt, Germany, when we were living out in pup tents for two weeks. And the other was the various opportunities to travel in Europe on our various furloughs. Why would that business in pup tents uh, come back to you more than anything else? It was a, well, prior to going in the Army, I used to enjoy camping up in the foothills of the Adirondacks. And this was kind of like, an, like a, a muddied up camping trip. Uh, we'd be out on the roads much of the time, uh, setting up communications and exit route uh, definitions, and sleeping in pup tents. It was in the middle of winter, so we had to contend with snow and a couple of times with ice storms. Uh, It was just an interesting Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> That's a nice memory in a way if you enjoyed camping. Mm -hmm. How about a, a most memorable character, uh, somebody that you think about perhaps uh, you're still in touch with? Well, I'm not in touch with him, unfortunately. He passed away several years ago, but a fellow that I had known from high school, uh, we used to go many places together. We used to 
uh, played touch football with the other guys. He and I were sort of a combination, if you will. And we used to play ping pong and cards, just very compatible. Uh, unfortunately, he did pass away. But he went back to Albany and spent his, the remainder of his life there. I came to Boston and have spent the rest of my life over in this general area. Okay. Is there such a thing as a most humorous experience that stands out in your mind? Yeah. Something yeah. really funny? Yes. On this particular uh, war games period, the operations command, uh, officer of the battalion used to get drunk every night and we would cart him off to his tent and <laughs> put him in a sleeping bag and then go back to doing whatever we were doing. Uh, I can still remember his name, which I won't bother to tell anybody, but he was quite a citizen. Yeah, that's something you'd keep in mind, wouldn't you? Organizations that I'm aware of service-related organizations are pretty conservative and my political leanings are are not sympathetic with them. I'm not much of a joiner, I guess. Okay. Um, you came home and you... Was it easy, uh, hard, indifferent for you to slip back into a civilian life? Oh, I think it was fairly easy. I don't think I was ever anything but a civilian all the time I was in the service. Uh, no, it's, uh, the transition was my recollection and very smooth. Did people ever talk to you about your military service or do you uh, talk to people about the, your wife, for example? Did you ever tell her about sleeping out in the ice storms? Oh, yes, from time to time. Uh, one of the things that I am most fond of rec recalling were the 10 days we spent in Norway because that was the 1952 Winter Olympics. And my wife is Swedish extraction. We met many Norwegians when we were there, comparable uh, national traits. And we were just so immensely impressed with the uh, hospitality, the friendliness, uh, the beauty of the Norwegian people, and this comes up fairly often. So you got to see that giant ski slope, uh, that um, ski slide at Oslo there? Yeah. yeah. That's impressive. <laughs> mm -hmm. We spent several afternoons at the ski jump and various downhill courses, uh, skating venues, yeah, it, it was a marvelous experience. Good for you. You uh, moved readily from being a civilian to the military back to being a civilian, but how important to you when you look back on it was serving in, in the military? In terms of the direct military experience, I would say it's something I certainly would never have volunteered for. Uh, except perhaps in, a, in an all-out war situation. Uh, I'm glad I was in the service. I'm glad it was part of my uh, maturation experience. I'm glad I had the opportunity to see as much of Europe as I did. I'm delighted that I never was exposed to any actual combat. Aside from that, I just really don't, don't think about it very much. Although at one point when our son was growing up and he was not much of a student and we had the possible, and if he could not get into college, the Army was something we considered for him. A couple of years of service, not necessarily the Army directly, but military service might have helped him to formulate a certain amount of discipline and self-control, which we thought he was lacking. For one reason or another, it never came to that. He 
got into college. And it never, never reached that point of our making a decision. But that, that was an option. That was an time. option. A yeah. couple of years of maturation for him before he tried to get into college again. We tend in life, I think, to have a viewpoint about an experience we're going through. And you must have thought about, well, here I am in the Army and I'm 20, 21 years old or something. Has your feeling changed about uh, whatever you thought about the experience then? Have you looked back on it now some 50 years later and thought, is, is your feeling about it different, the same? I think it has not changed. I think it's about the same as it was. I liked the service in some respect. I liked some of the people we were thrown in with. I thoroughly disliked some of the others. It was a, a mixture of the same sort of uh, arrangements, mixtures, uh, associations that I would have had in any other climb of life, I think. People know that you were, in, well, people that in those times knew that you were in the Army at the time of the Korean War. I'm not sure if you were lumped together as a Korean War guy or a, an Army guy at the time of the Korean War. That, that's a distinction that may have been made or not. Can you comment on um, how guys who did serve in Korea were received when they came home vis-a-vis -vis World War II or vis-a-vis the Vietnam War? Uh, I really can't say. I was not directly in contact with any of the people who did come back from Korea. I knew of quite a few of them, people primarily that I had been in college with, but I didn't have any direct contact with any but one. And how he was treated, we never, never discussed. I know he went through hell. Uh, went into the same the service just about the same time I did and came back at the age of 24 or 5 with totally white hair and many personal personality aspects of having been through very tra very great travail but I did not see much of him uh, he lived in Connecticut I was up here uh, and I did not see very many other veterans at that point in time. So I really can't say I know that the World War II veterans were given a great deal more uh, acclaim and receptivity, if you will, than during the Korean War. And certainly it was different from the Vietnam War and the treatment the vets got coming back from that. But I, I really didn't have that much personal feeling one way or the other. All right. Did you yourself, Lou, uh, take advantage of any veterans' benefits since the war, as such as uh, oh, hospitalization, the GI Bill, or insurance, or anything like that? Insurance was the only thing. I kept up a, a, an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Fortunately or otherwise, I never needed uh, and never had recourse to any of the other benefits. Okay. Is there, above all, any one thought or incident or anything you would like to share with your family or people who will look at this tape? No, I can't say it. It had that much of an impact on me. Uh, I, as I said, I was glad that I was in the service in a out-of-harm's way that I had the opportunity to gain some experiences, primarily travel in Europe, and meet some people who, one person in particular, who has remained a, an associate, a contact, a friend, mm -hmm. through the years. But other than that, I, I can't say the service. Uh, there were a lot of unhappy times in the service, as there is for everybody, uh, doing things you don't particularly like to do taking a lot of uh, direction from people you don't particularly enjoy associating with. But they tend to smooth over over time and you remember the good things primarily and not the bad.
that's a very uh, good note in which to end this. Uh, we want to thank you for coming in today. We appreciate your being here, and you're a very articulate <laughs> man. We enjoyed having you today. Thank well, you. I hope I can. I hope I shed some light, at least on my own personal experience.